Hello everyone, my name is Zach and welcome back to my channel and welcome to another video for the Paper Cup Book Club where today we are going to be talking about The Diviners by Lippa Bray. Now I don't have the book here to put up anywhere because I listened to the audiobook of it um, so I wish I had something to display but I don't so sorry about it. Hey what's up, I had a spoiler free section but it sucked so we're doing this now. Here's the abridged version. I gave the book 4 stars, it was good but not great. The audiobook is really good. I think this is going to progress like a video game franchise where the first entry introduces the premise and then it's refined and made better in the sequels. Alright now, on to me telling a dumb story. So that's kind of it for uh, spoiler free thoughts, but before I go into spoiler heavy thoughts, I want to tell a little bit of a quick story just to kind of highlight how much of a legend Reed with Cindy is. So if you saw my update, you will know I talked about February always being a hard month for me and my depression always being really bad. So I had decided ahead of time that I was going to take February off. I wasn't going to do any book club books. I was only going to read books I wanted to read because I wanted to read them. This was before I walked into the library and saw a Dreamcatcher sitting on the shelves and knew I could rid myself of it forever and shut my morbid curiosity up if I suffered through it and read it, which I did. And that was a mistake, but back to the point. So I made that decision, and I was sitting there watching the live show for uh, Pretty Girls, and I was kind of sad because I kind of feel like in my own special way I've become like a, a part of this book club. Like I'm certainly not a host, but you know I do these videos, and and a lot of people in the kind of community around this book club uh, look up to me and interact with me. So I, I almost feel like you know. Maybe I'm not a host, but maybe I'm like the president of the fan club. But anyway, I felt like I was kind of letting people down. I'm like, oh, you know, the hosts, they always seem to kind of take what I say into consideration. A lot of the time, they a lot of times they bring my points up. Um, and, you know, it's not going to happen this month. And that was kind of a little sad for me. And I thought, maybe Cindy will pick something that I, I was already wanting to read. And that can just be my excuse to read it. Uh, may, maybe Cindy will be an absolute legend and, and just pull one over on me. And wouldn't you know it, not only did she mention a book that I was interested in reading, she picked a book I was halfway through at the time. So I think Cindy might be uh, psychic to some capacity. I, I, I just, you know, how does she do that? How do you do it, Cindy? But so lo and behold, even though I was taking the month of February off, uh, I was already reading the book, so um, here we are. But anyway, uh, that's the story. I just wanted to tell it because I thought it was kind of funny. Uh, Cindy, I'm on to you. I'm, I'm like 95% sure you're psychic and you're not telling anyone, but I, I see you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, dumb story and patting myself on the back aside. Uh, let's get into some spoiler thoughts on The Diviners. So, uh, big old spoiler warning. But uh, one last thing to take care of before that. Um, the plot of this book, I'm actually going to compare to another piece of media I've seen. And uh, viewers of the channel will know that I often have Silent Hill 2 which is my favorite story of all time here in the background. But unfortunately, since we'll be comparing it to something else, it's got to go. So, sorry, beautiful, but you're not here today. Nope. Instead, we'll be talking about a piece of media that's a lot more close to the Diviners. Silent Hill 4. I'm a fanboy. What'd you think? I wasn't going to talk about Silent Hill this video. <laughs> not in your life. I had to move it because of the glare. Um, so I don't think my room's possessed. I, I moved it myself. But anyway... Uh, Silent Hill 4 is about a cult member who becomes a serial killer to complete a cult ritual and he comes back to life through supernatural means to try to complete this ritual sacrifice serial killing that he had been doing. And The Diviners is about a cult member turned serial killer who ends up coming back to life through supernatural means and tries to complete all the sacrifices to complete the cult ritual. I just wanted to bring that up because I thought it was funny about how close they all are. Um, but getting into spoiler thoughts, uh, at least with Silent Hill 4, um, him coming back to life is actually part of the ritual. By completing the first, I think it's the first 10 sacrifices, he's able to uh, release himself from the bonds of flesh and able to keep killing. It's weird. It's Silent Hill. You gotta get over it. Um, however, in The Diviners, it's because idiot kids are playing with a Ouija board. I would love to meet a lot of you. It'd be cool to meet you, but I'm going to put a little warning out there. If I'm talking with you or hanging out with you or I meet you at a convention or whatever, and you pull out a Ouija board or, or you start, you know, being like, let's do Charlie Charlie or whatever the kids are doing to try to summon demons nowadays. Uh, just want you to know that these hands 
can and will become colorblind and race blind and will smack you because I don't fuck with that. Please, no demon summoning in my presence. If you wanna if you wanna screw yourself over and do something dumb, you do it away from me, okay? Just putting it out there. So funny story, when I went to do this video, I was trying to remember how Naughty John comes back to life, and I asked Kat, because I know she really likes the series, and she couldn't remember either, so uh, I had to look it up, and then I realized literally the first thing in my notes was, rule number one, don't fuck with the Ouija board. <laughs> Good job, me. But but yeah, it, it's a fine start, you know, sure. If you got to wake in spirit some way, a Ouija board's not a bad way to go, but it was just like... You fucking idiot kids with your idiot Ouija board. If, if you just not try to summon a demon, you wouldn't have summoned a demon and the world would have been okay. But let's move on from the Ouija board and from me comparing this to things I've already seen. And uh, I want to talk about a couple of other things and then we're going to talk about the characters because that's really what everyone cares about with the Diviners anyway, or at least that's what it seems like. Uh, number one, I want to talk about Naughty John. Um, Naughty John, I think, is a pretty effective villain. He has some good creepy moments. I, I like the idea of kind of bringing a, a fanatical cult member, serial killer, um, back to life. Uh, I like it in Silent Hill 4, but the gameplay absolutely sucks ass. So I was like, oh, now I can have that same basic story, but in something that doesn't make me want to die while experiencing it. So props to you, Diviners, for making my dreams come true. I should have said my lair of dreams come true, but I was not that clever in the moment. So missed pun opportunity. But, but I, I like the idea of Naughty John. I just wish he wasn't Nate and Naughty John because, like, he's actually kind of spooky and creepy. And then they're like, we gotta stop Naughty John. <laughs> Maybe it was on purpose to juxtapose, you know, his name versus his actions. And, you know, it's supposed to be kind of humorous, but it's just like... <sighs> I want to take it more seriously than I could because it just... Anytime he popped up, Naughty John, Naughty John... Like, it's hard to take a villain seriously when he's called the same thing that, you know, my uh, grandmother might have called my uncle when he was younger. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so I, I think he's an effective villain. I think he's effectively written, um, though I do wish he was not called Naughty John. Um, working in the song, that was kind of, um, that was a clever way to get to get the plot moving, to get the murder mystery kind of, of solved and to be able to follow through everything, so... Um, I think that was all good. As I said, it's just naughty fucking John, man. Another thing I want to talk about is kind of how this, um, re reflects the black experience of 1920s New York. This is something I also saw in the Ballad of Black Tom, and I really like that authors are, are starting to, um, portray this, you know, I think accurately. Obviously, I wasn't there, so I can't say. But, you know, there's the point where, uh, Memphis gets arrested and they plant um, the numbers on him, and he's like, you know, he basically knows he's screwed, he says, you know, the word of two white cops versus a black boy, who are they going to believe, and so he just kind of has to deal with the fact that, um, not only is he being arrested, basically because he's a black boy, but the evidence is being forced upon him, um, and it, it's heartbreaking to see, but I think it's important in books like this, especially books aimed at young adults and teens, to really kind of reflect that experience and not shy away from it and pretend like it didn't exist or he's able to overcome that racism. It's just he kind of learn learns to work through and work in the system. And so I'm glad that um, Libra Bray didn't shy away from that. Let's talk about the ending too real quick because um, one of my main problems with this book and the reason it got four stars not five is I feel like we spent a lot of time with the characters, but I feel like the plot kind of suffered um, because of it. Kind of like what I talked about earlier about setting up the series and everything. Um, so we got a lot of character, and but the plot was kind of slow because of it. And I kind of wish it had a, a better balance. But Libba Brady, she like takes the whole plot kind of slow. And, you know, it feels like things are, are like really obvious before like they actually happen, at least to me. Um, and then... Like, right at the ending, when you're waiting for that, like, hook to really end to book two, she, she suddenly throws, like, 17 plot threads at you, like, one right after the other, and you're just like, what? 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 Calm down! Ah! Uh, it was just a little much. I wish she would have pumped the brake and either um, leaked all these kind of loose ends 
throughout the later half of the book a little more evenly or just picked one or two of these and focused on them because like I can't even remember all the things she introduced and I you know I finished this book like two weeks ago because I just remember it was like one right after the other after the other after the other and I'm sure they'll all get addressed and you know get paid off at some point in the next three books but it was just a lot especially after the kind of slow methodical pace of the first half to suddenly in the last you know hour of the audiobook just be slammed with new ideas and and new plot things happening it was just very jarring so um the actual ending of, of naughty john was was perfectly fine but as far as the actual ending ending of the book with with the lead-in to the sequels um a little much for my taste but enough with all this mumbo jumbo plot and Silent Hill comparisons and me being a fanboy of this book club and Cindy. Let's talk about what Emma wants to talk about. Let's talk about my thoughts on all the characters, shall we? So I have 11 characters written down that I kind of want to brush on, starting with some of the smaller characters and, and kind of working our way up. So the first person I want to talk about is Isaiah, uh, Memphis's little brother Isaiah. Um, I really love him. He's kind of the classic sort of annoying little brother the big mouth little brother that just cannot keep his mouth shut and his mouth gets him into trouble. And I really like how this character is portrayed and I really like his relationship with Memphis. That brotherly bond I think is is really well done. Where it's obvious Memphis cares about Isaiah, even if Isaiah is kind of annoying, even if Isaiah keeps getting everything into trouble and nearly gets himself killed because of his big mouth. I think it's just a really good portrayal of a, a young boy who's kind of excited he still has that kind of lust for life um before depression gets a hold of you when you're a teenager <laughs> am i self-projecting maybe a little bit but i really like this character even if he's supposed to be a little annoying uh it was kind of annoying in an endearing way unlike other characters that we will get to next i want to talk about blind bill johnson um blind bill broke my heart because as I was reading this book, I was kind of picturing him as some of the famous, like, blind blues players. So people like um, Blind Willie Johnson or even Robert Johnson. These kind of famous figureheads in blues music that kind of revolutionized everything and set, and set the path for rock. Um, I kind of pictured him in that, so I grew really attached to him because I really liked that music and, the, and a lot of the other kinds of music I like were impacted by that. And then it turned out he was kind of evil, or at least self-serving, at the end, nearly kills Isaiah, and I was like, Bill, I liked you. Why you gotta do me like this? I just, I was really sad, because he seemed really cool, and I should have known it was coming. I guess I, guess I, don't, like, I don't like being fooled, <laughs> and Limit Bray got one on me, I guess. So I guess that's my, <laughs> my big problem with uh, Blind Bill Johnson. But you know who I don't hate? Henry Dubois IV. Henry is great, uh... Musician comparison number two. He kind of reminds me of like a young Count Bassey. Uh, if I remember, I'll link a interview with, with Count Bassey, who's a famous uh, figure in the history of jazz. But kind of this kind of chill person who can just kind of sit at a piano and just play. And he's got kind of a good sense of humor about himself. Um, I really like Count Bassey's music as well. So that helped. Um, but he's, he's just kind. He's not afraid to be himself. I really like his relationship with Theta. Um... I hope he has more of a role in the sequels because I really liked him and I, in my opinion, I didn't see enough of him. So, uh, Henry Dubois the fourth, we stand and we salute. Um, hats off to you, good sir. Next, I want to talk about uh, Memphis's aunt. I want to say her name was Aunt Octavia, but um, I might have that wrong, so don't hold me to it. I'm kind of in two minds about the aunt because, like, on one hand. I kind of feel like she's like a black stereotype, the kind of older black woman that's, a oh, praise Jesus, we must pray for this, oh Lord Jesus. But like, it's still at the end of the day, she still is trying to do right by her nephews and she's trying to do the right thing. And so like, I want to like her, but also that whole stereotype thing is in my head. So I'm, I'm really conflicted about the aunt and I hope she gets better. I hope she gets a little more nuanced if she's in the sequels, which to be honest, it wouldn't break my heart if she's not. Uh, speak, speaking of relatives, uh, let's talk about Uncle Will, who is the biggest cypress in the swamp. He's a giant stick in the mud. Let me introduce you to most of Will's dialogue. N-O-No. No means no. No, 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 no. 
He's basically there to wag his finger and to be, like, the voice of reason, even though in this scenario you don't need the voice of reason because you're dealing with a supernatural serial killer. Um, so Will just got annoying after a while, and then at the end when he's like, Evie's too dangerous, I want to send you back to New York. Why? She's already fought a serial killer. I think she's earned her right to stay, man. Like... But next up we have Maybelle, who is just a, a sweet little dumpling. Uh, I love Maybelle. I want nothing but the best for her. Uh, I know we kind of had that hook at the end with her, like, love interest. If he turns out to be evil and does wrong by my girl, I will riot. She, she is just too wholesome, too pure. She needs to be protected. And don't do my girl dirty, okay? That's all I'm asking, all right? There's other characters you can do dirty with, but, like, make other characters suffer. Not, not Maybelle. She doesn't deserve it, all right? All right, good, good talk, okay? Next we have Jericho. I liked Jericho at the start, but then something dawned on me. He acts exactly like 14-year-old Zack acted. I don't much care for 14-year-old Zack. So after that, uh, I, he slowly lost favor with me, and, and by the end of it, I'm just kind of like, I, I don't know if I really care about you anymore. Also, I just can't shake this feeling like he's going to do something sketchy, uh, in one of the later books with this whole, like, guy he's meeting in, the, in these vials of whatever the hell this is. What was he, a cyborg or something? That was kind of, like, not explained well, and I feel like it wasn't explained well on purpose. Um, so I didn't fully understand what was happening. Um, and I don't know when I do understand what's happening if I'm going to like it. So. Also, I, I, sh I shipped Jericho and Maybell at the beginning... And then I realized that, like, Maybell, I guess, kind of likes him for his looks, because, like, he, he doesn't have much in the way of personality, at least not that I can see. And, like, he sucks, and in, in, he doesn't deserve her. So, like, I was happy when new love interest for Mabel was introduced, because I was like, no, no, don't, don't put Jericho and Mabel together. Please, no, just don't. That, and they didn't have any chemistry so, to begin with, so, like. And the next up, we have Sam Lloyd. I kind of hate him. I, I especially hated him at the beginning, which I think you're supposed to hate him because, you know, he is a thief. Uh, he kind of got better by the end of the book, but he he's going down that territory of character that's always angry slash just wants revenge. And, like, that got old. That character archetype got old years ago for me. So I hope to God he grows in the sequels if he's there because at this point... Um, anytime he's on the page, I'm like, can, can you leave? He didn't even, like, do that much helpful. Like, in the graveyard scene when they're confronted by all the cult members, I was thinking, oh, maybe Sam Lloyd will, will show up somehow and his ability to not be seen will, like, play into it and he's going to rescue them and it's going to be good and I'm finally going to like Sam. And then, and then he didn't do that. Evie just kind of yeeted the lantern and that was enough for them to run away. So, like, you're not helpful. Not really. I guess there was the one scene they slipped into the, the jail, but um, that's so small that you, you could have written around that. So he's not that useful, and he's not that likable, so, like, I wish we didn't focus on him so much. That's all I'm saying. But at last, we come to the last three, uh, kind of kind of the big three, in my opinion. Uh, Miss Theta Knight. What a gal. I love her sense of humor. I love her kind of swagger to her. Uh, I love that she sticks up and cares about her friends. I love her interactions with Memphis. Um, if, if you didn't see on Twitter, I thought she was going to die um, in the scene where Naughty John comes to the auditorium. And I, I sent a message to Kat. I was like, if Theta fucking dies, I'm never reading anything you recommend to me ever again. And I meant it because uh, I was not ready for that emotional trauma if I had to watch Theta die. At least not this early. Like, let her get through the whole series and die an honorable death if she has to die, which I really don't want her to die. But because I don't want her to die, she probably will, and fucking Sam Lloyd will probably live because that's just my life. That got dark, I'm sorry. Uh, but speaking of Memphis, he, he's our second to last, and Memphis is maybe my favorite character. I like, like I said earlier, I like how him being black matters and the black experience of 1920s New York is written into the story. I like that he's willing to do basically whatever he has to do to take care of his little brother. 
but he still has ambish ambitions of his own he's working on. Uh, love his relationship with Theta, and just everything about him. He's just, he's, he is the type of guy I love to see in YA. I'm really tired of the bad boy love interests and then nerd archetype, which I feel like are the two biggest ones in YA. And I feel like Memphis is a really good blend of, you know, he's he's got some charm to him and some wit to him, but he's also, you know, a little emotional and he really has um, that family connection that really grounds him. And he's, he feels like a real person. He doesn't feel like a character, which I think is something that YA, especially YA men tend to struggle with. You either have the bad boy flirt or you have <laughs> nerd character. And to finally see a, a well-rounded guy, he reminds me a lot of a, a friend I had in high school. Um, it's really refreshing. And so as a guy, I really appreciate that. But we come to our last and maybe least <laughs> character of the day, Miss Evie O'Neill. Girl, get your shit together. <laughs> I don't feel like I really need to say anything because almost everyone I hear is just goddamn it, Evie, like, <laughs> all the time. It, it's like Rose from Doctor Who. Like, she's sort of endearing, but also, like, really frustrating because she's just ne never doing what you want her to do. I, I feel like this criticism extends to a lot of the other characters that I don't like, um, but... I think Libba Bray really wanted to establish in this first book how flawed she is and that she's impulsive and she, you know, she's selfish and she does things because she wants to. She's kind of, I don't want to say hedonistic, but that's kind of the, the word that it's coming to mind, you know. She just, she's flawed. And I understand that. But in this book, I don't feel like she makes that much progress. And it's kind of that whole, you know, this one book suffers for the series argument where she has a lot of room to grow but because she doesn't grow a lot in this book and she's heavily flawed, she's a very frustrating protagonist. Do I think she'll get better? Yes. Do I think she's badly written? No. She's kind of written to be frustrating and flawed and mission accomplished. It just wasn't fun to read about. So um, that's kind of my beef with Evie, but I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. I don't know too many people that are like, what? I loved Evie. What do you mean you didn't like her? Because most people are like, But I think that is all I wanted to talk about today. Uh, I finished this like two weeks ago, so my thoughts are all over the place, even though I have notes. Um, looking forward to seeing what everyone else says. Uh, I will be shocked if most people didn't enjoy this book to some degree, because I, as I said, I feel like it was really good, and it's pretty famous on BookTube. Um, so uh, I guess I'll say I do plan on continuing. I do have the uh, second book on audio ready to go, so like definitely happening. As I said earlier, gave it a four star because I feel like it was good, but I feel like it wasn't great so that the sequels could be great, but this one was just good. And I never know how to segue out of my videos, so uh, I guess I'll just say uh, if you like this video, feel free to give it a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe if you feel so inclined. Let me know your thoughts on the Diviners below, and I will see you at the Papercut live show. I think it's March 7th at 5. If I'm wrong, editing Zach will put the information here. And I will see you next time.